In our politics lead, the fate of more than 2,000 migrant kids separated from their families by the U.S. government is still unclear. One consequence of beefing up security at the Mexico border has been the splitting up of families. Nearly 2,000 children have been separated from their parents. The battle over the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy on immigration is intensifying, with lawmakers in both parties condemning it as cruel and inhumane. As the news started to unfold and it became very clear that the administration had adopted a policy where they were separating parents and children who had crossed the border uh, coming over from Mexico into Texas, I started getting lots of calls and emails from colleagues, from friends, from Ropes and Gray alumni saying, this is horrendous. What can I do to help? What can I do? What can we do? And it suddenly occurred to me, it, it was sort of obvious. Well, I can figure this out. I can go to Texas. Jenny Rakoski was our first lawyer who dropped everything and on her own dime went to Texas to figure out how can Ropes and Gray help. She found Port Isabel, which was a detention center where not that many lawyers were helping out. Jenny came back from her first trip and said, I think this is what we need to do. That's where the greatest need is. We'll figure it out. My job as director of the pro bono program and pro bono council was to help put together a structure uh, for how um, Ropes and Gray could respond in a way that was effective and coordinated. For a series of about eight weeks, we sent down teams of Ropes and Gray lawyers, and each week the team would bring back a few families as ongoing clients. Looking back now, we had about, I think it's 110 lawyers who volunteered to help out. 18 of them were partners, 90 were associates in council. We had 17 summer associates who jumped in. And what I find in some ways even more compelling is that on top of those timekeeper hours, we had 80 plus support staff around the firm who got involved in significant ways. Once we actually had an opportunity to go in and meet with our clients, there were two key things we were focused on. One was learning what was going on with their children. It was the parents with whom we were meeting. And to try to do everything that we could to get the pieces we needed to find out where their children were. And then the other was starting to collect information about their personal stories to see whether there was any hope that any of them could bring a valid asylum claim. And as part of this effort, one of the things that we decided as, as a firm, as a program, was that we were willing to take on the families for full representation, so both for reunification and then also on their immigration proceedings wherever they may lead. Well, one of the great things about this program is that even though you have, we had different teams going on a week-to-week -week basis, there was continuity. We Basically, clients were passed from one team to the other. And so I picked up a number, a number of cases, and they were at varying stages. Some of them were at the inception, and we were trying to help clients be prepared for what was called a credible fear interview, which is the preliminary interview with, in front of a, an immigration officer to determine whether there's any possibility of asylum. Our job was to, to try to bring out their story figure out the most important parts of the story and fit them within the contours of what could be valid grounds for asylum. Through the work of the border management team and the border work leadership team, we developed a fantastic network of translation resources. The families who became our clients through this initiative are overwhelmingly Spanish speakers. And the only way of communicating with these clients is either through Spanish speaking attorneys or through translators. And we've had an overwhelming response of attorneys, support staff, and friends of the firm coming together to facilitate this representation. The clients always seem relieved to have attorneys there willing to meet with them and speak to them. I spoke Spanish, which seemed to make them happy and more comfortable. They all wanted to know about their children. That was usually one of the first questions they asked if their children were okay, when they would be able to see their children. And then we walked them through what we knew and we tried to gather information from them.
Somewhere about week six or seven on that Saturday call, we learned that all of our clients were who were at Port Isabel were going to be switched to Carnes, which is a facility, I believe it was about eight hours away from, uh, from Port Isabel. We had people planning to fly to Port Isabel the next day um, and had to pivot literally overnight and redeploy our team to a new facility at Carnes. The week that um, I went, it was supporting our clients that were still in detention. At that time, there were 10 of them. And it was also supporting RAICES. Um, RAICES is a nonprofit group based in Texas, and that was our pro bono partner at the Carnes Detention Facility. And so RAICES said, are you available to help with one of our clients? And I said, yes, absolutely. Um, I met this man from Honduras and his son, his 14-year-old son. Both were there present um, in the visitation room, it's called. His particular story was that there, there was, um, you know, the, the gang um, in Honduras, and they threatened him with his life. Um, they killed his two cousins and he went to report that to the police um, and he he thought that because he made that report that's why this gang was after him and they threatened his entire family and so we got on the line with the the asylum officer for about two hours um, at one point the asylum officer asked one question of when did it happen when did that happen over and over again and my client just started shaking and crying and it was in front of his son, his 14-year-old son. I mean, he was tell giving graphic details of how they killed his cousin in front of his child. So I asked if we could take a break, that the client was, you know, very upset. We came back to the interview. The interview finished. So we're now about three hours into discussing it. And then the asylum officer says, counsel, would you like to make a closing statement? And I said, yes. I took one moment and I just gave the biggest closing statement of my life that I could for that man. I just went through the asylum, the, the elements of an asylum claim. I focused on nexus, and the, the week following I found out that he had been released, which means he passed his credible, um, well, his reasonable fear interview. The vast majority of the firm's clients have now been released and reunited with their children. I'm working with six clients, three fathers, and each one of them has a child. We represent both the father and the child. They've been released, reunited, and are staying with family or friends. We started judicial proceedings for all of them seeking asylum, and each of them has reported to their local ICE office and will continue to do so periodically as required by ICE. We expect that it probably will take two to three years to resolve their cases, and we plan to represent them through finalization. I am so proud to be a partner at Ropes and Gray, and mostly I feel really grateful. I'm grateful for the assistance and support that the firm has given to people who need it so desperately. I'm grateful to have the ability to make a real impact on someone's life because of the seriousness with which this firm has responded to the crisis.